Let's welcome back our good friend, Rabbi Yamin Rose, editor-at-large of Mishpacha Magazine, former editor-in-chief, a legendary journalist whose expertise in Middle East politics and, of course, the, as it relates to the firm world, is totally unparalleled. So, Ben Yamin, thank you so much. been a while, but I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Yaakov. It's good to get back together with you and also to reconnect with your audience. Absolutely wonderful. They love it. I get such good feedback. They absolutely uh, are very eager for this. Uh, we were get, we are going to get to the Haredi draft law, which has been very big in the news in recent days. President Biden's huge pressure campaign against Bibi Netanyahu, maybe President Trump. But first, there are late breaking reports as we record this that Israel has agreed to a potential hostage and ceasefire deal. And the reports are saying that now the ball is in Hamas's court to decide. So what are you hearing about those details? We're hearing the same thing. Uh, one thing we have to keep in mind is that there's a lot of psychological warfare going on on both sides. So uh, one of the things that both the IDF spokesman and Prime Minister Netanyahu has said all along is he said, wait for official reports. Don't believe all the rumors you're hearing and are going to hear. So uh, we have to keep that in mind. Anything that's out there, any, uh, any reports that don't come from official sources are not official. So... Uh, Obviously, we're all hoping that uh, we get the hostages back and on the best possible terms for us. Unfortunately, what's happened is that, uh, you know, Hamas seems to have the upper hand in this particular area. They know that it's a weak spot for Israeli society. And uh, that's the reason why they took hostages at the beginning of this war. So uh, for Israel to uh, get the deal they want, they're demanding right now that they want a list of who's still alive. And uh, after that, then we'll start uh, finalizing the deal. But so far, Hamas has not been forthcoming. They don't want to give away anything, including a list of names, until they get some concessions in return. So at least as we're speaking right now, things still look a little bit stuck. But again, we're, we're hopeful that uh, there will be a break and that we'll be able to get the hostages back or as many as possible on the, the best terms possible for us. Very hopeful. And of course, yes, every life is precious. The lives of the hostages, I mean, are so dear, especially when you talk about the Jews and about Eretz Yisrael. So let me ask you, and I take what the AP says with a grain of salt at best, but the AP reports are that a potential, and let's put into context here, Ramadan approaching, and there's a huge amount, an unthinkable pressure being put on Israel uh, to uh, carry a ceasefire before Ramadan. Why they would cave into that, I don't know what kind of pressures they're under, but that's the discussion. So I feel like that's being uh, a push against Israel. The reports are that uh, they've accepted a proposal, more or less, including a six-week ceasefire, very long ceasefire, and the release would be hostages considered vulnerable. So that means that I think the majority of hostages at this point are probably adult males, probably not elderly. Uh, the question that we have is, and again, uh, we, we have no idea if this is accurate, but let's assume for a moment that such a deal uh, were put into place. I don't understand, and of course, like I said, the lives of the hostages are so precious, but I feel like it puts Israel at a major strategic disadvantage. Six weeks, giving Hamas a chance to regroup. I wanted to know your thoughts. The last time that uh, there was a ceasefire arrangement, so it lasted about 10 days, and uh, uh, that was uh, long enough to uh, get the hostages back, the ones that we got out last time, uh, but not too long that it took away our war momentum. Uh, a six-week uh, ceasefire, I can tell you that uh, from... Uh, People I've uh, heard from in the IDF, uh, they're very much against it. And I'm talking about people in the field and uh, the officers. Uh, you know, they know that to be stuck in Gaza for six weeks like that, because it's not like Israel's going to withdraw. So to be stuck in Gaza for six weeks with all of the uh, booby traps that are going on that unfortunately have cost the lives of many more soldiers in the last few days, and uh, uh, with uh, allowing uh, Hamas perhaps to uh, reorganize or to at least start uh, moving back into the north, uh, the area that we're, we first reconquered, would be very dangerous. So uh, you're right, you're saving the lives of a lot of the hostages who are very precious, but at the same time, we're endangering uh, the lives of the soldiers in the field and we're taking all the, the momentum away from us. Uh, I'm not sure why Ramadan has to come into the equation. I, I pointed out in one of my columns a couple of weeks ago that... Uh, Nobody seemed to uh, feel so badly for us when Egypt and Syria attacked us on Yom Kippur in 1973. And nobody seemed to point out uh, uh, that on our happiest day of the year, or what should have been the happiest day of the year on Simchas Torah, that uh, Hamas chose that day to attack us. They don't seem to be any, uh, to show any concern for our holy days. So 
uh, I'm not sure why we have to uh, be so concerned for theirs, but yeah, uh, th that seems to be the way it is. Israel always is trying to prove and show that uh, we uh, have a country where there's freedom of religion for all religions, and that's part of the equation. So uh, it, it's not a good deal for us. If you take a look at Channel, 13, uh, Channel uh, 14, which is the one very right-wing TV station, they've been calling it the Iska Hamuf Keret, well along it basically a, a it's a, a it's a deal which they feel we're abandoning uh, uh, everything that uh, we have going for us it, uh, that might be a little bit strong but uh, i think that's how a lot of the right wing flank feels yeah very interesting take but yeah like that that's when you look at this and what they're discussing and again we'll see maybe it's a bluff maybe they think Hamas will reject it uh, like you say, Ramadan, Ramadan, it's a bogus piece of uh, leverage tool. It's a negotiating chip that they use when they want to pull it out. It's totally insincere, as we as as we know. But you're right. Unfortunately, it works because I see the response here. You know, when they talk about Ramadan and they're talking about a six week ceasefire, which, of course, would encompass the entire Ramadan. So, you know, there's a part of me that really, really hopes that they don't give in to any deal that would be like you say, a more, do more harm than good. But I can't help but wonder if they're feeling enormous, enormous heat. And on that note, Shifting a little bit, President Biden, I want to know what you really think about President Biden, and uh, I want to know you had your finger on the pulse of the Israeli perspective. President Biden, in the beginning, he talked a big talk. People gave him a lot of credit for being a close friend of Israel. He traveled there early on. What has he really done? And I'm going to come out a little strong here. Um, you know, he promised billions. They haven't gotten the money. I understand you'll blame Congress. I saw a piece you wrote a few weeks ago. I want to get to that, where you blamed equally Democrats and Republicans, which is fair. Uh, but, but Biden... He's not discussing it. He's not pressuring it. He's kind of letting it play out, just totally sitting on the sidelines. Um, of course, we know the things that he said about Bibi Netanyahu, very, very strong, demeaning words that he said behind the scenes about Netanyahu. He imposed sanctions on, on settlers in the West Bank, farmers. He imposed sanctions on specific Israeli farmers. I mean, a U.S. president, we've never heard of this, in addition to the billions to Iran and all of that. So um, not, not to lead the witness here, but I want to know what, what your opinion is of Biden and his relationship with Israel. Well, Yaakov, you led into this very well. I don't have all that much to add after what you said, but uh, I will back up and say a couple of things. Uh, Biden's initial visit to Israel was very much appreciated. Uh, he did show uh, personal warmth and, uh, and caring, but uh, I felt all along, and I said it and I wrote it, that all of these people who came, including Biden, including uh, Macron, the, uh, the head of France, including uh, Rishi Sunak of uh, Britain, uh, all of these people came because they wanted to manage the war for us. So Biden at the very beginning it. is said, you nailed yeah, it. Yeah. Biden at the very beginning has said that, fine, we understand that you're going to have to fight back. And we understand that this could be a very significant war. However, uh, we would like you to do it on our terms and not on yours. And that's part of what's happened. Uh, the fact that we're sending soldiers into booby trap buildings instead of, uh, instead of bombing them, uh, uh, not even from the air, but using what they call the Moab bombs, uh, you know, the bunker busters. Mother of all bombs. concession. Yeah, it is a, is a concession to the U.S. Uh, the fact that we're just uh, doing a few pinpoint attacks here and there against Hezbollah in the north uh, is a concession to uh, the U.S., although uh, I understand the, the idea that we don't want to get involved in a massive uh, second front war, especially with Hezbollah uh, uh, on their terms. Uh, because they have much more accurate rockets and many more rockets than Hamas, and they can cause uh, serious significant damage to Israel. So I understand we want to avoid that. But uh, again, the U.S. Uh, has wanted us to fight everything on their terms. The uh, we understand that there are uh, uh, that there's international law that requires uh, allowing humanitarian aid into a war zone. Uh, but Israel is being asked uh, to do uh, lefi meshurat adin, if you will. Uh, they're being asked to go above and beyond what international law calls for in order to provide this aid. And, and when you see how the aid is being hijacked by Hamas, then uh, I'm not sure why uh, there's all this pressure on us. But what uh, Israel needs to say is that, look, we would like to have humanitarian aid. Uh, we want to abide by our commitments and by international law. But you know, every truck we send in gets uh, hijacked by Hamas before uh, uh, before it gets to anyone. Uh, if uh, citizens do manage to get their hands on bags of flour or uh, other goods, uh, they end up reselling it at uh, usurious and outrageous prices to uh, uh, their uh, colleagues and friends and neighbors in uh, Gaza. So uh, the, the way that the humanitarian aid is being doled out is not working. And... Uh, 
the more that is not working, the more the blame seems to be put on us. Uh, right. It's like, excuse me, but what? There was no humanitarian crisis in Gaza before uh, the the Israeli invasion right. in mid October. Uh, you know, excuse me, Hamas has been uh, uh, running Hamas for uh, I'm sorry, running Gaza for the last 17 years. And uh, where was the outcry when they were uh, building tunnels and uh, storing weapons underneath mosques, underneath playgrounds, underneath schools, uh, in cahoots with UNRWA? You know what? There was no humanitarian crisis, so, so why is the onus all on us? And, and, and this is my major critique against the Biden administration, that uh, they're not uh, uh, they're not uh, calling a spade a spade. They're not uh, saying, okay, you know, ninety nine percent of the humanitarian crisis existed beforehand and was caused by Hamas, and uh, the more pressure they put on us, uh, the worse it makes Israel look. And uh, uh, the, you know, that's, uh, that puts us yeah, in a tremendous The more that Israel does, the more they get blamed. Just the same way that on October 6th, nobody was talking about a two-state solution and nobody was talking about recognizing the Palestinian state. Trump had basically, you know, buried that. And then October 7th comes, Hamas carries out these horrific atrocities. And now they're in a better negotiation standpoint than they were in years. It, it makes absolutely no rational sense. And I, and I want to ask you, let's talk about the, the stampede before we get to the Haredi draft law. Uh, which, of course, is kind of a, a tangent to all of this, uh, the stampede where the, the Palestinians attacked. And, and I just also want to mention right, right now, Israel, nobody's talking about this. Israel has 300 trucks on the Israeli side of humanitarian aid waiting to get in. And the U.N. and, and everyone's blaming Israel and Israel saying, bring it in. And and they're waiting for the U.N. to come in on the other side and make it happen. Is that correct? Yeah, we don't have the full story uh, yet as far as uh, what happened with the stampede. Yes, there are many uh, yeah, Israeli the trucks. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, there are many Israeli aid trucks that try to get through, and uh, 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 some of them are stalled. That's why you see uh, the airlift right now that's going on, which is uh, a bit laughable because uh, a lot of the packages are landing in the Mediterranean and they're not landing on dry land. <laughs> well, he's not Ukraine. Biden said that they're landing in Ukraine before they corrected him. But uh, I do want to mention the New York Times. Christopher, the New York Times said that the whatever packages do actually land on land are going to get stolen by Hamas. New York Times is admitting that. Yeah, that's exactly what's happened. And uh, as far as the stampede is concerned, so the official Israeli uh, uh, advice right now on that is that, firstly, we don't know what the exact death toll was. You know, the the Arab side is claiming 100 or more than 100. There's absolutely no evidence of that, uh, just like there was no evidence of the death toll in uh, the hospital attack, uh, Al-Shifa Hospital, uh, many, uh, uh, couple, many months ago. Uh, so we don't know how many people really uh, were killed. Uh, the IDF is saying that most of them were killed in a stampede because they were rushing these aid trucks to try to get uh, the goods before anyone else could. And uh, what they said is that Israeli troops did fire at some of the uh, people who were there because they charged the IDF troops first and they were looking to, uh, to start a fight. And uh, the IDF troops fought back. And there were probably a number who got killed. Uh, we're saying somewhere is around 10 uh, by IDF fire, but not more than that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the media jumps to uh, uh, jumps to a conclusion. Uh, I remember seeing uh, MSNBC on Thursday, and they were saying that uh, uh, 100 uh, Palestinians were killed in an attack. No, they weren't killed in an attack. Uh, most of them, whoever died, Again, we don't know the number, but it's probably far less than 100. They died in a stampede, not in an attack. So uh, again, the final word hasn't been spoken on this. We're still waiting for uh, more information. Now, a lot of the soldiers wear uh, cameras on their helmets. So uh, a lot of these battles are filmed. And uh, in short order, we should be able to uh, to uh, have something a little bit more official on this. Right. It'll probably take another couple of days. And that's the problem, kind of like you alluded to with the hospital story, where they put out this story. They do not know the facts. And they don't even care about the facts because it's great propaganda for them, anti-Israel. And then by the time the actual facts do come to light, it's a little kind of too little, too late. They don't retract it. They don't go back to it. Even if they do, people don't notice. So, you know, the, the, the way, way, way much damage is done versus, uh, you know, any any kind of rectification later on. But thank you for you know clarifying what we do know until now. Uh, all right. I, 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 like I said, keep saying Haredi draft law is such a big story right now. And I guess in a nutshell, you know, there's a, a an expiration coming. There, there was a nine month deal made last summer before the attack. And this has been ongoing for we, you and I have discussed this a million times because, I mean, this saga has been going on for years and years. And just, you know, delay after delay where we when we think 
something big or terrible could happen where it just, you know, it just keeps getting delayed and really not much has changed, practically speaking, over the last few years, except that many have, have enlisted in the idea of post uh, Shemini Atzeres. So the real question is, um, now there's a war of this magnitude happening. Obviously, there's a ton of pressure. Now the court has basically threatened Netanyahu that if his government doesn't come up with some sort of rationale for the exemption of the draft to continue, then it, they're going to let it expire. So tell us, I guess, what your thoughts are. Is that even accurate, what I just said? And uh, like, how is this going to play out? Like, What's your projection here? So uh, those are all good questions. Uh, firstly, this has been going on for well over 20 years. Uh, starting in 2002, uh, there was a law called the Talat Law, which uh, allowed uh, the continuation of the deferments for uh, Haredim as long as they're studying in yeshiva. Uh, two years later, uh, the Supreme Court said that, uh, uh, sorry, that's uh, unfair to uh, uh, the rest of the citizens uh, to give exemptions just to one sector of society. But they didn't uh, say that you had to uh, come up with any remedies at the time. So let's fast forward then to 2012. In 2012, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, the Tal law is unconstitutional, which is always, always find that term funny because Israel doesn't have a constitution. So <laughs> to say a law is unconstitutional, I guess it's just a term that uh, the media throws around. But uh, whatever, it doesn't really matter. They said that uh, it's not uh, lawful. And 2014, they came up with a, another plan, which was the one that was in effect for a short period of time, where they set quotas. And they said, OK, so, you know, we see that uh, you're not really doing anything to draft Haredim and the Haredim themselves are not stepping forward. So we're going to set quotas. After three years of the Supreme Court that the quotas were not being met and they said, OK, so that law is no good either. And that's what started the whole round of the five elections, the, the 2017 Supreme Court ruling that uh, uh, that the quotas weren't being met. And uh, at that point, uh, Agudas is Israel, uh, one of the uh, uh, parties that makes up uh, United Torah Judaism, uh, said uh, uh, we're out. And uh, Degala Torah stepped out too. Uh, Shas then stepped out. And uh, that led to uh, five elections in uh, six uh, years. And uh, that's basically where we are right now. So now to fast forward, uh, and I'm going to get to what you said earlier. Uh, last, uh, so... so what we have is, uh, we don't have a draft law. We have not had a Haredi draft law since 2017, since the Supreme Court said, whatever law is on the book is unlawful. And because of all the elections, it's been pushed off. What happened was last June is what you mentioned, is that the uh, Israeli government by, let's say something equivalent to executive order, decided that we're going to uh, uh, keep the uh, deferral on the books until further notice until we can come up with a new law. And what uh, the uh, Attorney General has said, uh, as of a couple of weeks ago, is that, well, you can't do that anymore. You can't uh, run things by executive order in Israel. We don't have that system. So uh, therefore, uh, you have to uh, come up, number one, with an explanation in the Supreme Court by uh, March 25th uh, to explain why you're not doing more to draft uh, Haredim. And then uh, by the end of April, if they don't come up with the plan, then all bets are off and uh, you know, anything can happen. Uh, you could have a situation where uh, uh, the courts rule that the uh, Haredim have to be drafted. And uh, of course that would cause uh, you know tremendous uh, uh, dissent, uh, certainly in the Haredi community. Uh, on the other side, if they don't do something to uh, uh, even out uh, the draft situation and make things look more fair, uh, then you could have tremendous dissent uh, on the secular side and say that, you know, we, uh, you know, we've tolerated this for 75 years, but we're not going to anymore because the military needs are much greater. So uh, how this plays out, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, getting back to the political uh, situation that you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, so I mentioned this uh, on my uh, Homefront podcast that I do with the uh, Gedali Guttentag a couple of times a week uh, last Thursday. And what I said is, and I'm just saying as a, uh, as a voter, because the Haredi parties don't need my advice. Uh, they go to uh, the Rabbanim and the Gedolim, and that's who uh, uh, give them guidance and instructions on uh, on what to do. So I'm just saying as a voter, as someone who votes for the Karedi parties, uh, I feel that they should try to get the best deal they can in the next couple of months when Netanyahu is still in power and when Benny Gantz is still part of the government. Because Gantz also is not someone who uh, who's crazy and who wants to go out and say, OK, we're going to empty out the yeshivas and draft all the Karedim. Gantz, for all my critique of him, is a sensible man 
and a centrist. And he would probably be content with, okay, let's set a quota, but let's really try to have a real quota. Let's set it higher than it used to be. And also let's have a little bit more enforcement on the yeshiva and that they really have to prove who's in yeshiva and who isn't. And uh, someone who isn't in yeshiva and who really isn't learning full time then uh, should be eligible for the eligible for the draft. And, and I think that there's already politicians who would potentially accept that kind of a deal. Uh, that's one option. Uh, the second option that I've heard is that the Haredim will say, you know something, if uh, you come up with the draft law that we're not happy with, then we're going to topple the government. And as long as there's new elections and uh, it takes six months to uh, hold elections and form a new government. So the funding that's already in place for the yeshivas will remain in place. Uh, you know, that's uh, it's an option, but I, I think it's a riskier option because we have absolutely no idea what the next government is going to look like or even what the parties running it is going to look like. It might be completely different from what we see today. So, uh, again, uh, I'm not giving advice here. I'm just saying that uh, uh, there are risks involved uh, either way. There's there's a risk involved in toppling the government and hoping you'll get a better deal from the next government. And uh, obviously there's a risk in agreeing very quickly to something under pressure that uh, might not be palatable either in the Haredi community or to the secular people either. Fascinating. And I'm curious, uh, Batsalo Smotrich uh, wrote an op-ed essentially saying that, you know, this is not a good idea uh, for the Likud to alienate the Haredim over this. And, uh, you know, but he made some kind of point that um, uh, Benny Gantz might go to the Haredim and kind of offer them a deal where uh, he, like a total exemption, Smotrich, I think, said for like 100 years, basically use this as a chip to dissolve the government and to kind of uh, pull the Haredim away from Netanyahu. Do you see that uh, at all? Do you envision such a possibility? It's interesting. Look, when you're on the inside, like uh, Vassal Smotrich or anyone who's in the cabinet, uh, you probably see and hear all the machinations that are going on. Uh, somehow, I'm skeptical of that scenario because uh, Gantz right now, uh, even in the, the latest poll released by Channel 14, again, which is a right-wing media outlet last night, uh, they surveyed 20,000 people last week. And uh, they show Gantz only with 27 seats in the next election and Likud creeping back up with 24. But for Gantz to even come close to that number, and, and again, we have no idea what parties are going to run and, and what the parties are going to look like. But for Gantz to get anywhere near that number, he's got to come up with a deal that's palatable to the secular. And uh, if you take a look at the uh, the uh, secular newspapers, mainly Haaretz and uh, and Ynet, they're, they're not big fans of Gantz. They don't look at him as, ah, you know, this is our left-wing hope. Uh, they know he's a centrist, uh, and many of them consider him center-right. So for Gantz to offer like a blanket exemption for a period of time, uh, not only won't that pass the muster of the Supreme Court, but uh, uh, I think that Gantz would be committing uh, political suicide for him to do that. So. As I said earlier, I think the more likely uh, way out of this is to come up with the with the quota, whether it's enforceable or not, but a higher quota and a little bit more enforcement on the yeshiva world. And then uh, perhaps we can uh, kick this can down the road for another year or two until uh, perhaps we can get a little bit more uh, order in the Israeli political world. What, what I would like to see as a citizen, I would like to see the war come to a successful conclusion and quickly which means uh, Israel applying uh, the maximum military force that it can, and finally conducting this invasion on Arafa in the south, uh, whether they have to wait six weeks or not, and uh, finishing uh, that sector off, uh, dismantling all the Hamas battalions. Then I'd like to see an investigative commission to uh, uh, really explore the failures in intelligence and the failures in uh, the decision-making process. Uh, I don't want to uh, go to the polls. I don't want to have another election and vote for people who may be found... Uh, very guilty uh, of being the I, ones who, uh, who, uh, who who brought this mess upon us. I, I think we need time, just like they did after the Yom Kippur War. They had the Argonaut Commission, and they came out with some very, uh, very difficult uh, 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 criticisms. And then a few months later, the government of Golda Meir fell. I think that should be the proper order. Let's do this in order. Win the war, have the commission. Once we understand what went wrong, and who was responsible, then we'll have a, a, a better option in terms of, okay, so who's going to lead uh, the government uh, going forward? And 
on what basis? What are the grounds? What are the new ground rules based on uh, uh, the failures that uh, we uh, uncovered? I couldn't agree more. You're in Israel. I'm in America, so very, very different, you know, perspective. And yours is much more, gen you know, genuine and out there. But, but, um, you know, the you, the more reports that come out, the 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 failures of not only intelligence, but there were people in the government who were blowing the whistles, who said they're training, they're ready. I mean, there were all sorts of different signals. There was an informant, and uh, yeah, that's what happens in Israel. Israeli government. I mean, hands get kicked down the road and kicked down the road, and. Very rare to see any kind of accountability. You know, there have been a lot of uh, things in the past, nothing to of this magnitude, of course. So uh, I'm really curious about that. You're right. I mean, it makes no sense to vote for politicians until, and and they keep saying, uh, not until the war is over, not until the war is over. That makes sense on a level, but it is kind of also convenient, you know, for the people in charge because, you know, the, the, this war, I know you're hopeful for something quick. I mean, from what I'm seeing and the, the projections that even the leaders are making, it could be a very long time. It could be another six, eight months. I hope not. Netanyahu uh, claimed that uh, once we start uh, a campaign in uh, Rafa Rafiah, then uh, uh, the war could be over weeks. in a matter of weeks. Yeah. I, I would agree that's probably over optimistic. Uh, but again, this goes back to uh, the U.S. as well. Rather than the U.S. putting all the pressure on us, if they came out every day and demanded Hamas surrender and uh, give up the hostages without having to make a deal, yeah. Uh, this war would also would probably be over a lot faster. Uh, however, they're not doing that. They're putting all the pressure on us for domestic political reasons and also because of their own worldview. And uh, uh, that's a big mistake that the U.S. is making that's hurting and undermining Israel. Uh, I think one other factor, Yaakov, we have to keep in mind here domestically is that Netanyahu is still on trial. We don't hear too much about it anymore, but he's been on trial for over three years. And uh, he does not want to leave without either being acquitted or uh, without uh, some sort of a plea bargain. So you know, right. any kind of a political arrangement that's going to happen that doesn't take Netanyahu's legal cases into account and, and find a way to wrap that up uh, is not going to be successful. Now, uh, we know that uh, about, I'd say maybe last March even, or April, uh, the court that's hearing uh, the case, a three-judge panel that's hearing the Netanyahu case, uh, told uh, the prosecutors, and they called the defense in also at the same time, private meeting, which of course got leaked. And they said, we don't see any evidence of bribery after uh, hearing all this testimony from uh, dozens of witnesses. So they asked uh, uh, the prosecution either to drop the bribery charge or to come up with some sort of plea bargain. So it made uh, a big fuss for a couple of days here. And uh, then the prosecution said, okay, well, you know, we're, we're continuing on. And of course, because... Uh, People don't like, a lot of people don't like Netanyahu. So there was no pressure on uh, the prosecutor to uh, actually uh, come up and uh, and do a plea bargain. And, uh, you know, so that's where we stand. Uh, nothing's happened. The case is still going on quietly. And uh, no one has proven anything except uh, Netanyahu uh, made a few uh, uh, not good decisions, shall we say, about, uh, you know, who some of his friends are and the uh, and uh, and the you know normal political wheeling and dealing is basically what we've seen in the case. You know nothing resembling bribery, uh, just uh, some poor judgment on his part. And uh, you know you don't convict someone uh, for having poor judgment. You vote them out at the poll. So yeah, uh, that also has to be part of the equation. Okay. Uh, any before I let you go, and I don't want to let you go, but before I let you go, any final thoughts? Uh, I would say that uh, the most. Uh, interesting aspect of all this is the uh, focus on uh, uh, Achdus, uh, unity here in Israel. And uh, we really have seen a big change in that regard. But uh, I, I want to caution people that, uh, and, and I wrote this line uh, a few months ago at the very beginning, that uh, don't confuse unity of purpose with the meeting of minds. We definitely have unity of purpose here in Israel. And that's big. Uh, it's, a, it's a big sea of change compared to uh, what we had before. Uh, we understand we have a common enemy, we have a common cause, and uh, we have to push forward. But it, it doesn't mean that the people have really changed their political viewpoints. Uh, there's uh, The people who are on the left are still on the left. Uh, the people who are in the center are still in the center. And I, I think the, uh, the swing to the right politically that people talk about uh, is a little bit exaggerated. Fine, if we had a new election, I'm sure Itamar Ben-Gvir would do much better than he did in the last election. But you know, other than that, uh, I don't see a real uh, political swing. Uh, but again, I, I do see uh, determination to uh, carry forward. I do see the uh, 
the uh, the charity and uh, and the, uh, the the benevolence of the Jewish people and uh, the willingness to go out and volunteer uh, to help uh, soldiers, to help their families, to uh, uh, to show uh, to show support for the families of the hostages. And that, that's a good thing. I'm happy to see that. I hope that continues, and I hope we can continue to build on that. If there's one good thing that could come out of uh, all of the terror and uh, all of the deaths and the injuries and the destruction, it's that we'll continue to pull together little by little as people, and, and maybe we will be able to uh, take that uh, unity of purpose and uh, also transfer it to the political sphere as well. Excellent, excellent. Very, very well said. Very powerful. And yeah, the actus, I mean, uh, even from afar, is is something yeah, we've almost never seen a good point you know in terms of putting the perspective on it and not getting carried away but as you as you always do all right we're going to leave it on that note i could literally it's so fascinating talking to you i love it i love every second i soak it up i could do this forever but we gotta you know you, you have a life you have to lead so i'm gonna have to cut the cord but uh Benjamin, thank you so so much your insights i'm not trying to pander you to anything like that i mean you have fascinating you have incredible clarity you put things into perspective. You're very, you know, you you kind of remove the emotion and, you know, I think you're a very emotional person, but you're able to just look at everything in this very objective. You're just a brilliant political analyst there. OK. And and, and I love it. <laughs> I can tell you that it's gotten harder and harder to keep the emotion out of this with everything that's right. happened. But, uh, uh, you know, thank you for your kind words. And, uh, you know, I always enjoy our conversation and uh, connecting with your audience. And, uh, you know, I hope that uh, the next time we speak that, uh We'll have a lot more uh, joyous news and we'll be able to uh, uh, talk about uh, how things have gotten better. Yeah, I mean, and I'm glad we plugged uh, the home front. I noticed that the home front uh, twice a week, the, the podcast. So that's amazing. Obviously, the columns in Mishpacha. So people should definitely check out all of that. OK, we'll let him go. Uh, editor at large, Mishpacha Magazine, former editor in chief, legendary, uh, masterful uh, political analyst, Benjamin Rose on the Vin News podcast.